Okay, with your permission, Ray, I will just say a few words in Turkish and then I will introduce you in English as well. Uh, right. It's now three past seven in Turkey and three past one, I think, in Brazil. So we can we can begin uh, with our with our webinar. Değerli arkadaşlar, e, Profesyonel Ses Derneği'nin e, 20. yılı nedeniyle düzenlediğimiz Perşembe seminerlerinin dördüncüsüne hoş geldiniz. E, bu seminer bizim için çok özel çünkü ilk uluslararası konuğumuzu ağırlıyoruz. İlk uluslararası konuğumuz benim çok sevdiğim arkadaşım e, Cerrah, kulaklığın bazı uzmanı, foniyatrist, e, sevgili Renaldo Yazaki. Kendisi Brezilya'nın Sao Paulo kentinde çalışıyor. E, orada kendisinin kurduğu bir artistik ses institüsü var. O enstitünün hem kurucusu hem başkanı. E, o bölgedeki, Brezilya'daki birçok profesyonel ses sanatçısıyla çalışıyor. Hem çok popüler hem çok dünya iyisi bir insan, çok tatlı bir baba. E, hep bir araya geldiğimizde birbirimizi özlediğimiz bir e, arkadaşım. E, kendisini bugün burada ağırlıyor olmak bizim için büyük bir keyif. Ben şimdi e, toplantıyı başlatacağım. E, question and answer kısmından ve chat kısmından sorularınızı devamlı sorabilirsiniz. E, en sonunda onları konuşmaya çalışacağız. İsterseniz sorularınızı bana Türkçe'de gönderebilirsiniz. Ben bir şekilde onları İngilizce'ye çevirip sormaya çalışırım. Hepinize keyifli seyirler diliyorum. E, dear friends and colleagues, e, today is a very great day for me because we are uh, experiencing the 20th anniversary of Professional Voice Society uh, Turkey. And as you well know, we are performing a Thursday webinar in uh, each week on Thursdays. This is the fourth one of them. Uh, you can see the uh, you can see the videos of the previous webinars on YouTube, and you will also be able to see this one as well on YouTube. Uh, this is a uh, this is an interesting day for me because on this Thursday webinars uh, we will be uh, we will be enjoying our first uh, international uh, international author, international speaker, which is a great friend of mine, uh, dear Professor Reynaldo Yazaki from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he's a professor at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. He's the founder and director of the Artistic Voice Institute in Sao Paulo. He has a great experience on working with uh, professional voice users in Sao Paulo in full Brazil. Uh, all the stage people and all professional and artistic voice users uh, really enjoy being with him. You can just check uh, Renaldo's uh, Instagram uh, page to see how happy they are when they are experiencing the time with Renaldo. Uh, he's a phonosurgeon, laryngologist, and phoniatrician, and he has a, a dedicated work on artistic and professional voice. It will be my great pleasure to uh, guest my dear friend Renaldo Yozaki today as our presenter. Uh, Renaldo, welcome, and the stage is yours. We will be uh, happily uh, to listen to you today. My friend, how do I, I want to thank you and want to thank you to the uh, Professional Voice Society for this invitation. And uh, I, I, I was talking to you uh, uh, some, some, some minutes ago that one of the bad things I, I found in my life and career is to share a specific experience. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm better than anyone or the best one or the best it, it, this or that. That means that I want to, to show people all over what I see in our practice as we see more than 10 singers or performers a, a day. So it's a form for the other ones who are starting uh, uh, to uh, raise experience, knowledge, and some insights that can be used to master and optimize their practices. So uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and I hope you, uh, and I hope that you enjoy all the words that are going to be shared uh, today. Well, I was invited to talk about uh, phonosurgery and in professional voice users. And this is the 20th year anniversary of, the, of your society. And it's the 15th year anniversary of my Artistic Voice Institute. This, that is my private practice here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, the, the title of the lecture is Tailoring the Cuts in Phonosurgery for a Specific Professional Voice Demands and Timbre. Uh, I start saying the phoniatrics is the specialty for the professional voice. 
uh, because I think that phoniatrics is more complete than other specific areas for voice. To keep the show going on, we as phoniatricians must masterize the knowledge of physiology and pathology. So one must know how their performance in that is regarding tessituric extension and intensities of the roles, uh, uh, sound intensities of the roles, how they are biomechanically achieving those roles requirements. So we as phoniatricians, we have to use the endoscope plus trained ear, always thinking about function and how the pathology involved is impacting negatively the uh, voice quality and uh, about uh, endurance. How many shows a week they need to present? How many days a week they have to teach uh, or they have to, to make uh, uh, speeches? And phonosurgery is, uh, without a, a, a, a shadow of doubt, uh, a part of phoniatrics. Why? Because as we think about function, we have to keep in mind this function when uh, changing uh, the morphology of the three edges of the vocal cords using technique and tactics and personal experience. And why, can I, why can't I say courage? Uh, uh, use, uh, they are used manually to attempt reestablishing vocal fold tissues in a functional way uh, uh, regarding vibration and Okay. Ronaldo, I think I, I clicked somewhere, some wrong place, sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, I can. Right. You, you can. Uh, I think sorry. that. Now, now you can do it. Annually used to attempt reestablishing vocal fold tissues in a functional way, always thinking about functional physiology. Uh, regarding. Uh, vibration amplitude and phase of mucosal waves uh, regarding bilateral symmetry, regarding fast recovery and coming back as soon as possible on stage, adequate contact of the free edges uh, that, that doesn't mean lack of glottal gaps. So we have to reestablish the situation that used to happen before the appearance uh, of, uh, uh, of the lesion. Uh, in our Artistic Voice Institute, uh, in these 15 years, we saw around 3,000 uh, singers. Uh, most of them are CCM singers, contemporary commercial music, and 20% uh, uh, around, 20% uh, is from classical single operatic singers. In my office, uh, uh, before the pandemic, I used to see around 10 to 12 performers a day, including Brazilian singers and foreign singers also. And we have performed 30 phonosurgeries and singers per year, and around 70 nasal or other vocal tract surgeries a year. And regarding phonosurgery voice professionals, I say always that voice is their main working tool, as in most of the economically active population. So we as nutrition, we are, we, we, nutritionists, we are very important to keep this working too healthy, to make more shows, to make more presentations, for them to persuade, for them to negotiate, for them to live. And so on, the real professional voice users, unfortunately, unfortunately do not have time or time in for voice surgery in most of the times uh, when they arrive to our office. Why? Because they are constantly and permanently uh, working. Uh, they have long-term future full agenda. So they have plans for a whole year sometimes. And because of professional and financial specific demands, they have to plan their stops. They, are, they have to plan their vacation. And so on, it's also for uh, voice surgery.
So it's not easy to persuade them to make surgery. And in great part of the times, we have to wait sometimes three, four, five, six months to uh, have uh, adequate time of recovery uh, in when performing a phonal surgery. And uh, phonal surgery faces to also some fears in these professional voice users. Artists, they have fear of losing definitely their voices. And we have always to think that we as surgeons, we, we become experienced throughout and within the years. So inexperienced surgeons have fear to obtain a first best result or a first non-satisfied singer. It's one of the greatest fears that we have in our, we have in our career. And their voices may be national or internationally notorious and renowned. They and we as doctors we, uh, cannot change their voice identity. We cannot change. If the voice is like this, we cannot uh, change it from water to wine. It, it has to be similar to the uh, previous uh, pattern that made them famous or notorious. And they always have a new job for the end of surgical recovery. When, when deciding and accepting the surgery, they always have, doctor, I need to be ready in two or in three months because uh, there will be a Grammy presentation, there will be an Oscar presentation, there will be uh, anything very important in their career. So it's not easy to uh, define uh, when to operate. And there's also, uh, uh, the, the phonal surgery also faces the fear in the team. There's a tendency here in Brazil for postponing or avoiding surgery. Uh, we have a very good SLP, speech language pathologist and voice therapist in our field. They have more than 50 years of uh, tradition in, in my country and uh, they are empowered and sometimes they, they tell the patient that they will save them from surgery. And this is a kind of prompt, ready phrase that is not good for us, for the team, for us surgeons and for the team surgeons plus clinicians and uh, logopedists and thinking ped pedagogues. You know why? Because sometimes they avoid or postpone something that is very disturbing their careers, that, that is handicapping too much uh, their singing or their practice, and uh, it will cost sometimes uh, two years, five years, that is too much in, fi in a 50 year uh, in general uh, career for a singer, for example. Some logopedists without post-operative therapy experience enhance their surgical fear of the patients. So I think that in the future, we have, we as surgeons, we must form and help them uh, more, the logopedists with solid experience uh, with surgical post-operative. Because if the logopedists know how to deal with the post-op uh, therapy uh, with more uh, uh, certainty, uh, they will accept more maybe uh, uh, uh, adding and getting together in the surgical process. So teamwork with non-logopedists and singing teachers and the main responsible for outcomes will be always a surgeon. I always tell my team that I'm the main responsible for, for the outcomes and I always have my own opinion about doing or not doing a surgery. I will not ask anyone uh, their opinion before I have my own opinion. And when I have my own opinion, I can uh, ask them, the logopedist and the singing pedagogue, if they accept uh, my suggestion. And then we will we'll, uh, follow uh, the steps of the teamwork. Uh, a very common question in singers is, will your scopus or laser change my timbre? So I went to the net and saw it in the Merriam Webster's definition of timbre. That is the quality given to a sound by its overtones, such as the resonance by which the ear recognizes and identifies a voice 
speech sound, and the quality of tone distinctive of a particular singing voice or musical instrument. In our practice, uh, the main component appears to be uh, uh, a component part of a timbre appears to be a, a, a laryngeal regarding the anatomical constitution of the vocal folds and its functional use. Uh, and why do I think like this? Uh, because after these 15 years performing tonsil surgeries, sinuses surgeries, septum surgeries, turbinate surgeries, uh, well, I have had no complaints after those kind of uh, uh, manip surgical manipulations. But I could have a, uh, a, de a detection of timbre alter alteration if I change too much uh, the, the vocal cords. And it's possible during phonosurgery to overtreat the patient or to transform, transform him or her in a very, very normal patient. We have always to remember that we all have unique and identical uh, identity, uh, unique voices. We are authentic, we are original. And why are we original? Because there's no vocal cord equal to another vocal cord in the world. Uh, we, we can uh, uh, be, be born congenitally with uh, uh, dilated vessels, vasculogenesias. We can be born with mucosal bridges. We can be born of different types of susi, socos, vocalis, minor, major. Uh, we can be born with differences between one side of the lungs to the other side. One vocal cord can be smaller than the other one. Uh, we can have uh, differences in, in, the, in the closure. The great part of the best singers I follow, they are born with, with a, a small gap without any lesion. They sing and work and live and earn their money, their income with a small uh, uh, uh, fusiform, spindle-shaped uh, gaps. The best singers in general, uh, uh, uh, in gender, uh, male and female, that I follow, they have this kind of situation. So anatomical variations help uh, them to have original voices. And uh, that's what I tell you. If I want to work with very experienced singers, famous voices, I have to always remember that I cannot be a hero. I, can, I have to avoid changing too much what the nature uh, uh, presented them at the very uh, beginning of uh, the use of their singing voices that in general in singers uh, start when they are around seven to nine years old in my practice. And so how to deal with uh, or answer uh, this pre-operative question regarding timbre and changing uh, voice. Uh, there's a need of knowing first the vocal preferences of the professional. We have to take it, take it into surgical thinking and consequently uh, into surgical tactics and technique. So there's not a surgery for a picture, for a lesion that is on a picture. There's a surgery for the voice that, is, that, that was before the appearance of that lesion. Uh, we can never anti-ethically promise or guarantee our surgical outcomes, but we can show them that they can masterize the vocal technique afterwards, after surgery. We can show them that, that they can learn more voices, more complete than the former one, uh, more voices that can endure more for uh, the repeated uh, jobs day by day in a month or a year. Uh, so there are other strategies that we can masterize and we, uh, we can tell them uh, with that with serenity and calmness they can have the voice back uh, if they are patient, if, they, if we control the anxiety and uh, if they follow the steps of the teamwork. And that's why I say that the main part of a treatment, I always have said that, and I, I learned that with my mentors, 
uh, the main part of a treatment is indeed the diagnosis and it will be always a diagnosis. And that's one part in which the intelli uh, artificial intelligence in the future will not be able to interfere because uh, voice is so unique that there's no examination that can put it into categories. If there's not categories, if there are not categories, there's no uh, way how to use artificial intelligence to make our diagnosis. So preoperative complete functional evaluation is essential. Uh, and the functional evaluation is also a diagnosis. What is functional? Uh, of course, we cannot uh, uh, uh, forget uh, the importance of the acoustic evaluation, the phonetograms, the voice range profile. But in my uh, experience, I have used in the last 12, 13 years, the functional fiber endoscopic evaluation of the, of the voice. Uh, in a very advanced manner in many parameters that one day we can talk about. And uh, uh, we can see how uh, uh, they use the laryngeal and vocal tract strategies to cope with and to adapt the phonation onto a surgical lesion. Because uh, there's, we, we can, with, without a uh, shadow of doubt, uh, in, in many instances, the singer or the professional voice user they come to us after more than six months of difficulties in voicing. So the lesion started many months, sometimes many years ago. So we can have with this uh, evaluation, uh, how to solve it partially preoperatively when at, uh, trying to treat uh, what, I, what, I call, what I call the tractopathy the pathology of the adaptations, biomechanical adaptations in the vocal tract. Uh, and definitely maybe with the post-operative outcome. And this is the protocol that I have presented in the last 10 years uh, for you in Europe. And uh, it involves many points uh, that we can uh, uh, differentiate people with voice complaints without and without voice complaints. So one day we can talk about this. And I think that this kind of protocol that I call laryngeal endoscopic biomovementology, we can see how they cope with and how they adapt the deformation onto a surgical lesion. And maybe it's a fine a refinement of the, our medical evaluation and diagnosis. Um, and I always say that the larynx is a professional dancer with bio movements. And these bio movements can be changed in order to maintain the voice mixture, the voice mix, uh, the way they, they go through the registers and regions of the voice in the tessitura. And this is an example of, uh, of how the, the vocal cords can elongate during uh, singing in this octave, from a low tone to a high tone, uh, around seven uh, sem semitones, you can see the vocal cords going in an easy manner uh, to a longer uh, configuration in the higher part of the tessitura. So, and this is important because uh, this kind of easy uh, elongation is crucial for the healthy uh, voice production in the higher part of the speaking voice tessitura and of course singing voice tessitura. So you can see that it's happening and of course after the passaggio they need to use the vocal tract to maintain the same pattern of the voices uh, below. And this is how we have performed surgery performed surgery uh, here in Brazil. And uh, uh, uh, here I use uh, as an idea of Dr. Paulo Pontes, one of the former IFOS presidents, International Federation of ORL Societies. Uh, he developed uh, a way of not using a microscope. Uh, around uh, 13 years ago, he had the idea to couple a commercial video camera HD at that moment, now full HD and 4K, into, uh, uh, together with some arms that can be coupled 
to the operating table uh, so that I can have the situation with the camera, the small screen here, and I can have a, a, very, uh, a very good and defined quality Im image in a, a Full HD uh, monitor. So this is what I can see, uh, and this, this is the monitor where I, I, that I use to perform surgery. So this is the beginning of the surgery, a very big pop, and this is quite in the, the, the, the, the, the, the end of the procedure. So uh, that's the way we, we perform surgery. And it's been 10 years of use here. And it's very cheap because we can buy a commercial camera for $500. And the system of worms can cost around uh, uh, 4,000 euros. Uh, uh, 3,000 euros, I think. So it's the way we have performed surgery. And the, uh, about surgical insights, the main causes of surgery here uh, in my practice is, of course, loss of the high tones. And the loss of soft voices in the middle to high tessitura. The, they always tell me, doctor, when I was younger, uh, before the problem comes, I used to sing at the higher part of my tessitura without any effort and without the need to increase intensity or uh, uh, the volume of the voice. But since the, the lesion appeared, I couldn't do it anymore. And of course, if they cannot use soft voices, they will have inadvertent passaggio breaks. Of course, the main passaggio is around 350, 40, 400 uh, hertz. And of course, we will uh, uh, go to a lack of mix in the voice. Uh, some, some of them, they avoid using the voices that are over uh, after the, the passaggio, after 400 hertz, or, they, or if they need to use them, they always uh, uh, shout, uh, almost shout to do that. And uh, one of the main uh, symptoms also is the lack of voice endurance to multiple shows. Doctor, I used to sing uh, more than 25 shows a, uh, a month. And now when I'm in the 10th show in the month, I, I get in fear because I'm worried about uh, finishing the last 10 shows in the same month. So lack of endurance to multiple shows or, or jobs. And when performing surgery, uh, and the, the word uh, very important uh, in performing surgery in very experienced singers is conservativeness. We have to be conservative. We have to touch less. We have to manipulate less. And of course, I will show this uh, figure diagram from Hirano, one of our laryngological genius in our history. And the, the, uh, the layers in the lamina propria, from the epithelium to superficial to the intermediate lamina propria and to the deep layer of the lamina propria where the vocal ligament is. And after this, the, the, the muscle, the vocalis muscle. And here we can see also the epithelium in the superior, uh, supraglottic portion of the vocal cord, the infraglottic portion of the vocal cord, we can see the free edges here, and uh, concentrically we can see the superficial layer of the lamina propria with very a very great content of water. And then when it starts to make uh, to be, get more dan denser, you can see the intermediate part, and in a very dense part in the uh, deep layer of the lamina propria that we will attach. Uh, very deep with the vocalis muscle. And when dealing with surgery, we have always to think about the noble character of the lamina propria. And, it, and these two regions are very important for post-operative voice quality. The less we touch this, the less we approximate our instruments to the vocal ligament, uh, the best and better will be the outcomes and a post-operative recovery and fast recovery to get on stage again. 
And I always tell you also during surgery that uh, there, there are two important lips in the free edge of the vocal cord. We have the superior lip that is this region, and we have the inferior lip that is this region. And there is a, a transitional area here where a great part of the, the contact happens. And in great in instances, in many uh, times, we can see that the lesions, they, they can appear anywhere here. They can take the whole free edge from the superior lip until the, the, the inferior lip of the free edge. They can take just the superior lip. They can take just the inferior lip. The inferior lip of the free edge, uh, I have seen in our practice, that is the most affected in people who do not sing. For example, teachers of the basic education. They, they don't, sometimes they don't have lesions here. Their lesions are infraglottal and can be seen uh, in many instances when they are not too big just uh, during stroboscopy, when, when seeing the closure phase of, of the glottal cycle. And we have to take in the, into account also that if we make, a, a, a, in order to preserve epithelium, if we make a, a, a incision here very far from the free edge, for us to achieve the important region, we have to manipulate this region and this is not good for us. Because in general, the supraglottal portion uh, of the vocal cord has uh, in, uh, superficial, superficial uh, lamina propria very, very thin. And, it, and as it's thin, if we hurt the intermediate layer or if we touch the vocal ligament, underneath it, we can have a scar. So if we want to be conservative, uh, it doesn't mean that we, can, we cannot make uh, uh, uh, uh, cuts here. We have to think about uh, our ease to remove the lesion. And I always uh, think about uh, the, the, the region uh, in which I can see the middle uh, line of the vocal cord. Every vocal cord uh, during our surgical or clinical evolution in, in the office uh, can uh, be uh, uh, evaluated regarding this line. That is the probably uh, probable line of the free edge. And I, if the lesion is here, I always make the, the, the, the, the cut uh, right a lateral to the end of the lesion. I, I never uh, make a bigger lesion just to remove just the gel underneath, uh, underneath the epithelium. Uh, and another tip that I have to tell you is that we always have to preserve at least one of the lips of the vocal uh, folds or of the free edges. So if I, if I intend to remove a nodule in the infraglottic inferior lip of the free edges, I have to preserve the superior lip. Uh, in general, uh, what, makes the, uh, what maintains the morphology, the habitual morphology, normal morphology of the vocal cords is indeed uh, the cut that we make here. Because this cut, will be the point uh, to, uh, on, uh, into uh, which uh, the, the, the system, uh, the, our organism will uh, heal uh, and make uh, and produce epithelium uh, uh, to that region. So if I have the medial line of the free edge here, I can remove what is needed uh, with more uh, calmness and and uh, without too much fear. But if we, if we don't define this uh, during surgery, uh, maybe we can have a, re a greater removal of the superior lip and together with the removal of the inferior lip, we can have uh, a, a, a tissue defect at the free edge that can be seen as a sulcus or a small scar there. Uh, the same is about when the lesion is here. See, if we have a bigger lesion in the superior lip of the free edge, we, we have, 
we will remove this region. So if I remove this region, I have to re, uh, preserve uh, the, infra, uh, the inferior lip portion of the free edge. So if I remove this lesion here, I will try to remove the jelly edema that is always there in order to maintain uh, the medial line of the free edges uh, as zebto as they were before the lesion appeared. There is this, this is a very important concept. And if you didn't, uh, if I couldn't be clear, then you can ask me at the end of the presentation. And, and that's why we have two vocal cords. Uh, having two vocal cords, and we, uh, we are born with an anatomical variations, and uh, I think the very uh, ideal and perfect uh, vocal cords and lamina propriaus and epitheliums are very, uh, very rare in clinical practice. Uh, maybe in my practice, I have around 30 to 40 person, uh, 30 patients, percent of patients with very ideal and uh, if perfect epitheliums and lamina proprias. So when deciding to operate a singer or a professional voice user in order to preserve timbre and to think about a, a needs uh, uh, of uh, absence of difficulty in getting the, uh, the voice back after the surgery, we have to take into account the evaluation side by side during stroboscopy. When we perform stroboscopy, uh, we have to, to remember all the principles and, and parameters that were defined by Diane Blass and Hirano uh, more than 30 years ago. And I think that uh, we have to look for where is, which of the vocal cords has the bigger mucosa wave? Which of the vocal cords uh, vibrates better? And the answer, if, if you didn't think about that, in many instances will be the vocal cord that is hurt instead of the vocal cord that don't, doesn't vibrate well because, because was born with a circle, with a circles, was born with a bridge, was born with a bigger uh, uh, vessel inside of it. So, when we see this difference and we have one vocal cord that cannot vibrate well since, the, since birth and the other one that is the bet, best one is with the lesion, we have to take it into our uh, uh, surgical thinking because we have to think this as the singer or this patient as this, the, a patient for a nephrologist, urologist that has just one kidney. So, uh, one kidney, unique kidney, we have to take uh, very much care when dealing with this kidney, in that case, that vocal cord. So the sur surgery will be even more difficult because of our, uh, our medical responsibilities. So uh, remember the step always, stroboscopy serves not just to see the lesion, for seeing the lesion, but also for detecting and diagnosing the best vocal cord. And for specific voice demands in professional voice users, uh, we have seen that the loss of the high tones uh, is, is one symptom always present when we have bigger lesions or chronic edemas that are in the superior lip of the free edge of the vocal cords. Very important for you to, for you to uh, take it into account in your future examinations. Uh, I want you to see your opinion after the session also. And uh, if this edema is chronic, it's there for more than six months, one year, it's very interesting to remove it. And in my practice, I have seen that if I need a, a small edema, a small edema is there for less than four months, with medications, inhalations, and voice therapy, we can cure them uh, using soft voices and speaking voice and uh, in optimizing the use of microphones and in-ear um, monitoring uh, of their voices during uh, speeches, lectures, or uh, stages. 
And another thing, the same edema, chronic edema nodule, small polyp that's there for many months, uh, we can uh, see in those patients the loss of soft voices in the middle to high etc. And why does this, uh, do this happen? This happen because uh, uh, they, they need firmer formations with more pressed little bit more pressed free edges for them not to break into other regions or registers and for not that for them not to break into uh, another semitone and of course singers don't do not want to, to make semitones during singing uh, during singing and that's why we need to think about surgery when uh, they they cannot manage it anymore and there's no uh, um, uh, improvement with voice therapy. And also passaggio breaks. Uh, they, they tell us, doctor, uh, when I was younger, I used to sing uh, in both uh, important regions of the voice without a knees that today it's impossible. I'm ashamed of my singing. Please help me, help me. I need to come back to my work and I need to sing the, the songs that make me famous. So I call it passaggio breaks. In general, they are in pop, pop music around 400, 400 to uh, 500 hertz uh, for male uh, singers and uh, uh, after G5 for uh, female singers. And we have to think about that uh, what is disturbing and uh, normal and natural singing is that lesion that's, that is over uh, the vocal cord. That can be a small edema, that can be a small uh, congenital edema uh, cyst that, that, uh, grew, that grew over time and, over, uh, and because of the career, or, or a small cyst that is there and because of work demand uh, it had its cap uh, around the epithelium with more chronic edemas uh, uh, over it. So I have to think about this passage breaks as one symptom also in general. If we uh, remove the lesion, the uh, passage breaks after, uh, right after the surgery, when they come back in the first uh, uh, uh, ex examination after surgery, will not be there anymore. And of course, the lack of voice endurance in Brazil is very common, this symptom over the other ones. And you know why? Because in Brazil, we have a very strong uh, fundamental, we have a very strong phonation. Now, we talk here in Brazil, uh, in general, over 75 decibels, uh, and it's a very big voice. And, and, and our voice in Brazilian Portuguese, I think that is two times bigger in intensity maybe uh, from our Portug Portuguese native from Portugal uh, speakers. So they uh, can uh, hide the uh, difficulties in soft formation by using very stronger voices with pressed free edges and that will postpone the symptom, total symptom appearance, but uh, will uh, worsen uh, the, the, the, the size of the lesion because when they come they, are, they have very big lesions because of this attempt to postpone evaluation, post, postpone uh, all otorhinolaryngologist evaluations, laryngoscopies uh, or because the, the uh, logopedists uh, teach them that they could uh, avoid surgery by trying to be clinical, just clinical and clinical. And this is an example uh, of how we, we perform the surgery using the system that I, I showed you. And uh, of course, this, this, this is a, a patient that came to me uh, nine years ago. Uh, and I saw uh, him when uh, I was working in a public hospital. But it's a way uh, to show how I try to manage uh, the, the, the incisions. For example, after the beginning of this uh, uh, uh, surgery, I, I always plan, well, if the medial line of the free edges of the vocal cords is like this, what could be the line of the free edges of the left vocal cord? 
where the lesion is. I think that could be this. I try to make in my mind a line that passes through the lesion and goes until this lesion. It seems that the, the, the normal vocal cord starts here. It doesn't start here. But uh, I, I will avoid to make uh, cuts in this region because I have to check if I'm right after performing this, the surgical cut, the cordotomy. So this is a very big polyp and bilobulated. There's a big one and a small one underneath it. And I will make the, uh, um, the, the cut with the with this instrument so that you can see this is the cut. Uh, it's a man, so the epithelium is thicker and it's more difficult to perform the cut. I always uh, like to perform the cut with the palpation uh, instrument. And then after this, after uh, making the The, the pocket uh, over the medial uh, original line of the free, original free edge, I have, uh, I can open. So my scission is until here, and then right after in the anterior part of the, of the, the, the vocal cord. And, uh, and I, I always try to remove the jelly edemas or the internal polyp of the, of the lesion uh, for me to guarantee the quantity uh, enough and sufficient to uh, try to make uh, a micro flap that is famous in our field. So this is a Japanese uh, prevention grab an instrument and I try to remove it from inside the vocal cord, taking care not to pull too much the other instrument, not to increase the size of the uh, chordotomy. And as, as soon as possible and as possible, I always try to work just with one instrument I know that it's more difficult, but it's a way to avoid increasing the size of the uh, um, uh, longitudinal chordotomy. And now I use a, a small scissor to define until where I want to preserve the epithelium anterior to the lesion and posterior to the lesion. Uh, and you will see that, uh, that we will do also in the posterior part of the lesion, right where it finishes. So we have two cuts, and then I guarantee that I will not remove more than needed in the anterior posterior aspect of the vocal cords. And uh, I, embryologically, the tissues over the vocal cords they are formed for anterior to posterior. And we have uh, our, the segments, uh, the dermatomes, let's think about the embryologic dermatomes, dermatomes, uh, they are always longitudinal. So if we have uh, a cut here and a cut here, if the lesion re uh, is removed, it will probably respect a, a, a line a very perfect line uh, of the embryologic uh, uh, epoch of our uh, of, of, of, of the formation of the vocal cords. So I'm grabbing the the polyp. It's in my hand, the empty polyp. I made other incision. So and now I have I can make another removal. And now I have. A very good micro flap here. Let me see if I can show you. Here, I have a very good micro flap here that 
in which I have plenty of reptilian here, more than needed, and a little bit less here in the anterior part of my cardotomy. And I will probably try to preserve, and the new uh, medial line of the vocal cord will be this one. So, but there's still inside of the lesion a little bit of jelly edema and uh, inflammatory process, uh, granulation tissue, and that's why it's, it's uh, uh, bleeding too much. So I will check for it in the next steps. Please, Haldun, tell me about the time. I don't have the time here. Haldun? Uh, I didn't sleep. <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> I just muted myself. Uh, we have plenty of time, Ronaldo, and uh, it's a great presentation. So we are happy to hear what you would like to say to us. So just just uh, keep on going. Okay, thank you. Uh, and at this moment, I use the Japanese uh, grabbing instrument uh, to make a maneuver that I call that I call it grab and slide. So in order to preserve epithelium, before cutting, I always evacuate and empty uh, the, uh, uh, the lesion underneath, below the epithelium. You will see that. So I grab it and then I slide it without removing epithelium. You see that? And always there is a jelly edema there, I will grab and then slide it, removing just the contact, the pathologic contact of the vocal cord. So that in this moment I have uh, uh, the new free edge and after removing the epinephrine, I can see the new free edge and I decided at this patient not to touch this region because uh, uh, we cannot have lack of tissue here. Uh, uh, otherwise, we could have uh, a small gap. Uh, this is one of the most important regions of the, uh, of the phonal surgery. We cannot leave too much disease here and we cannot remove too much here. If we think about removing more tissue, we can do it here from the middle to the posterior part. But this region isn't a good uh, uh, cho uh, choice because uh, the anterior commissure is a vertex. Uh, so uh, the mobile region is just this region here. It's it, here, it's a mobile, immob it's not mobile. So uh, to overcome a uh, lack of tissue here, it's almost impossible from uh, a therapeutic post-operative point of view. So this is the end of the procedure. And, uh, and when I uh, think about doing this kind of surgeries also, I want to tell the audience that we have to think about the difference between professional voices. For example, if I'm treating um, a very uh, famous a journalist and a TV journalism presenter that has been there for more than 20 years and he or she uh, looks for uh, uh, us to remove a polyp. We have to take into account that these journalists in general uh, do not sing. And we have to take into account over YouTube videos, over uh, Netflix, uh, anything that could have a record of the uh, uh, former uh, healthy voice, how their voices were. For example, uh, here I decided to remove the, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the whole edema, the entire edema. But if this patient uh, was um, a very uh, important uh, journalist who uses a very strong voice, a very low voice, um, a very um, Sinatra-like voice during speaking, uh, maybe I could change my mind. Maybe I could remove a little bit less of edemas and maintaining a little bit, a bit of edema inside of the vocal cord. 
but doctor, that's it, it, that's strange. You you you're telling us to leave a little bit of disease. Yes, because that's what I tell you. That is preserving the original characteristics of the professional voice. Uh, one example of a person who does it all the time is Stephen Zaitel. When he uh, uh, made, made pub, uh, public uh, uh, some surgeries, uh, uh, as in Steven Tyler or in Adele, no? in, in some studies, uh, he's one of the great uh, uh, defensors of the microflap. And if you take it, uh, take it into account, if you see the pre and post operative pictures of Steven Zaitel's, you will see that he always leave a little bit of epithelium and a little bit of edema in, uh, in the studies and reports that he has published. So, uh, other thing, if I had here um, uh, uh, a mucosal bridge in this region uh, that was not uh, uh, disturbing the voice, I will not assume that this bridge was responsible for the lesion, for the contralateral lesion. I will assume that this patient used to have a bridge here and because of excessive voice use, abuse, uh, excessive uh, intensity, intensity during singing, that is, inadequate voice technique for uh, serial uh, voice work, uh, that was the main responsible for the lesion, not the socos, the contralateral socos bridge. So if there's a bridge here, I will probably, if there's no edema in the same size, I will not touch it. Because this bridge, this socos, belongs to the original characteristics of that voice. What we need in the post-operative period is to work in conjunction with the logopedist for this patient in particular, uh, uh, try uh, uh, to avoid the excessive contact between the sulcus or the bridge onto the contralateral free edge. So uh, the same uh, uh, thinking is about the, uh, the theatrical actors uh, here in Brazil, uh, the theatrical, conventional theatrical, non-musical theater, they do not use microphones. And uh, it's a tradition. I hope that in the future it can be changed because I believe that the microphone is a way of preserving uh, uh, professional voice health, including in theater, in conventional theater. So if this actor does not sing, I will think about uh, doing a, a, a surgery that do not remove too much. Because uh, in general, if I have an edema that is from the anterior part until the posterior part, uh, this actor came to us because of a worsening in it. So I, uh, in this way, I can uh, uh, show you the importance of evaluating uh, other laryngoscopies, stroboscopies, uh, stroboscopies from uh, other years. That's why I clearly believe in the importance and role of, of the uh, uh, uh, checkup, uh, annual checkup and annual follow up of uh, vocal cords in our patients. Because uh, if this edema wasn't there, is, is there uh, since uh, 2001, 2000, uh, 2000 when the Professional Voice Society was created, uh, it wasn't because of the base edema that the patient came. It was because of a worsening in it, uh, because it's a bigger polyp in the middle third over the base edema, or, or an increase in the size of the base edema. And, and, and sometimes uh, that happened because of uh, uh, uh, uh, rupture in the uh, linearity of the free edge. When there is a rupture in this linearity of the free edge, in general, the, the, the region of the chronic edema uh, will have its height and its base inflamed by the friction uh, that is uh, unavoidable uh, during work because they have the, to give their 90 to 100 person during work. 
So it's very important to take everything into account, not to change. If the patient needs a very strong fundamental, if, if the patient needs a very strong voice in their practice, we cannot uh, change their voices to very uh, lighter, vo uh, to a very light voice. Uh, that's why I don't believe and I, I, I don't indicate performing surgeries uh, in patients who have so called vocalis in order to approximate the free edges. Because uh, this socos is there since the, the birth, and if you change uh, this pattern, maybe the patient will be uh, lost to. Uh, uncover and to reestablish and to find uh, the same uh, strategi strategies and biomechanical maneuvers that you used to do uh, before the appearance of uh, a bigger uh, the bigger lesion the were the worst lesion so uh, so this kind of thinking it can be applied to cysts congenital cysts to uh, socos with edemas in the inferior lip. It's very, uh, it's very common to find uh, uh, acute chronic edemas over uh, uh, socos vocalis. In that uh, uh, way, I believe that we can make an incision over the socos, uh, over uh, the, the, the, the, the, the line of the socos, and to remove the jelly edema of the inferior lip of the uh, socos vocalis. And remember, there's not just one socos. There are more than 30 types of socos I was trying to count in my practice, more than 30 types of different uh, socos. So uh, you have to take, take it into account what I, I call that is, uh, I call it customization of the procedure. Uh, being someone who reestablished the former normal is better than being the hero that will transform the, the vocal cord a very beautiful for the picture but not as beautiful uh, to perform functioning so the impression uh, after all is that we for nutritionists we are surgeons uh, surgeons worried about function and we cannot lose that i believe that the voice field around the world is getting too much uh, uh, ready to go to see the vocal cords and I, I, I have uh, uh, swimmed against this counter in a counter current in the last 15 years uh, because I, I, I saw that m some of my mentors couldn't teach me how a uh, detailed function of singing could happen that's what moved me in the uh, uh, last 12 years uh, so uh, we have to think about function first and about the whole detailed evaluation and then as a detail, not uh, uh, as important as the other ones, we can see the free edge, but not first the free edge. So we will, be, we will become the free edgeologists and that's not performing voice surgery in my opinion. And being conservative is the key point. And we have, we can try, uh, we, we have to avoid uh, the surgical closure of long-term known lesional gaps. Let's not blame the gaps without lesions. They were there since the beginning. And the one who are in, in front of you uh, became a professional and sometimes famous with this gaps with this uh, breathiness and sometimes breathiness is a charm is, a, is something beautiful we can have to think about Rod Stewart and his breathy voice Seal and his breathy voice Brian Adams and his breathy voice uh, Rod Stewart and his very effortful singing without uh, lesion and in, uh, when dealing with professional uh, singers and uh, voice users, we have to manipulate uh, uh, less and manipulate less is best. And the smaller the manipulation, the better. And the team with logopedists in voice therapy and singing classes with pedagogues is very important. And we have to think about first in our uh, practice uh, before lesion appears, we have to think about teaching them not to develop lesions. And lesion prevention is better for both physician 
and the artist and the professional voice user. I want to thank you for the opportunity. I hope that you could use in your, in your practice. Uh, of course, this is my opinion, my, my insights from my experience. And I want to share you, with you and I want to, I want to know your opinions uh, maybe with my WhatsApp here. And you can uh, uh, be in touch with me by these addresses. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Remelda, for this excellent and detailed presentation. It was really, uh, it was really pleasant to uh, see you and to listen to you, uh, to listen Thank to your you. great experience with the professional voice users. Thank you very much. Uh, we have plenty of questions from the audience. They just come from the question and answer part. They just come from, uh, from uh, WhatsApp messages to me and by emails. Uh, I will try to collect uh, them and try to combine them to make questions to you. About okay. the audience, I would, like to, uh, I would like to inform each of our participants that we have a large spectrum of uh, audience from different countries. As far as I counted now, we have, uh, we have attendees from like eight countries now. Eight? And among eight the countries. eight countries, yeah. And sure. among the listeners, we have internationally well-known uh, opera singers, uh, phoniatricians, phonosurgeons, of course. We have voice teachers from the conservatory. We have professional voice coaches and, of course, speech and language pathologists, audiologists. Uh, and we have just this, this uh, nice spectrum of listeners. So Thank you. <laughs> so the questions also uh, reflect that spectrum. Uh, if we begin from, actually you have uh, already mentioned some of them, but uh, I think uh, we should also underline some of them as well. Uh, for the professional voice users that you follow, uh, do you recommend them uh, for coming to regular follow-ups follow for voice checkups? You have already mentioned some part of it. Exactly. Uh, it, it's been around 10 years that I created in my office of course, I had uh, less power because I'm in private practice. I'm not in the university since, since 2010. I recommend them to come to a regular evaluation every 12 months. If they are in, in a regular basis uh, work using the same amount of voice. But, but if they change, if, if they start to, uh, to double the quantity of voice use over a period, and if they need to use a very caricatural voice, as in dubbing, for example, I always uh, tell them to look for me uh, when the uh, new symptom, new vocal complaint appears, or after six months. And what I do, I perform the functional evaluation of the singing voice, uh, of the professional voice, and the stroboscopy. And I always uh, uh, make the prevention of reflux, prevention and of uh, uh, allergic crisis. And I, I always tell them to look for me when they uh, are over a flu, over an infection of the upper airway so that I, could, I can treat the upper airway. And in the same month, when they come back in the same month, I, I can make the, the checkup and it's done for the next year. Great. Uh, actually, you have also uh, talked about this even at the answer of the first question. But what do you think is the best uh, combination to routinely examine or to understand the pathology in a professional voice? What I mean is, uh, what, what is the uh, algorithm or the combination that you use to evaluate? The acoustic analysis, flexible endoscope, the chip on tip, stroboscopy. Do you use each one of them for each patient or... Uh, how yeah. do you select them? What's the, what's the combination or the algorithm in your mind? Uh, the question is uh, the question of 1 million euros. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, every year, uh, every year they, they invite me to talk about that. What is relevant to evaluate as a minimum in, in the voice clinic, so, uh, in, in the voice field? Well, in my practice, uh, in our country, we uh, laryngologists, otorhinolaryngologists, phonetricians, we are not used to perform acoustic measures uh, uh, in every single patient. We know uh, what it is, we know uh, how to evaluate this, but we don't do it 
because uh, we have a very empowered uh, uh, logo, uh, logopedics here in Brazil. So in general, the, this kind of measures are, are done and, and registered by the speech language pathologists. But in my practice, what I do, uh, the history, uh, history, and then as a basics, I, I always ask for audiometric evaluation to check for the, the, the ears and, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, fiber endoscopic evaluation of the uh, uh, superior airway organs, uh, vocal, superior vocal tract, superior vocal tract. Um, and I, I, I see that biomovementology protocol, uh, uh, see the velum, the, the dynamics of function of the velum, uh, vocal fold elongation, vocal fold uh, shortening, uh, how the larynx goes upwards, how the larynx go uh, uh, downwards, and how they manage the uh, nuances and variations of vocalis muscle activation to increase or decrease uh, volume or intensity, how they need, uh, how they use and manage the vocal tract stru structures at the base of the tongue, epiglottis, arytenoids, and pharynx, uh, posterior pillars of the tonsils. Uh, and after, after that, I have uh, a kind of mapping, uh, how the uh, detailed mapping of how, of how physiology occurs at that, uh, with that specific professional voice user. And I do that not just for the singers. I I do that, that also for a politician, for a priest, uh, for uh, a docent, uh, professor, uh, and that's, that's been amazing because uh, we have uh, uh, plenty of uh, points to be uh, solved uh, with the therapy, with the logopedist, and of course I always see the vocal cords. Uh, it's very important for the practice to have a good camera. I decided seven years ago to buy a full HD camera, a surgical one that was quite expensive. I didn't have the money to buy it, uh, but that changed completely my practice because since then I don't get wrong when I see that, is, that, that is, there is a circles, when, I, when I'm in surgery, there is a circles where I saw during examination. And we have to use the stroboscopy. It's not just having the, the, the machine. It's not just having a Ferrari. We have to know how to conduct the Ferrari as well. So we have to check for more than one single musical tone. Uh, try to see around. If you can, if you have a trained ear, if you have a trained voice, maybe you, can, you could, could give examples of from the lowest tone through the, the main passaggio until the, the last tone, for example, in a male singer uh, in, in falsetto. So you can see how uh, the system copes and adapts through different sem semitones, and then you will be able to see where uh, some lesions affect more, more or impact more uh, physiologic, uh, physiologic functioning. Uh, and of course, always thinking of uh, ruling out cancer, uh, always taking into account the presence of signs, uh, laryngoscopic signs of Bilofsky, uh, of reflux, and, and treating allergies and treating other conditions as well. So, uh, uh, history, uh, fiber endoscopic functional evaluation, and then stroboscopy, detailed stroboscopy. And, and if I had here, I would do it every day, the voice range profile. Unfortunately, I don't do it here because it's, we are not used to it. Okay, thank you. We have a, a very clever and a very nice audience because you will have uh, important and expensive questions again. <laughs> what, is, what, is, what is your best remedy or best received? If we are just just before the show, just before the stage, we have a voice problem. Ah, uh, okay. What will be the life-saving recipe for us? Yeah, you know, or the, ca ca or the carrier-saving one. In yeah, in November two thousand nineteen, some uh, months ago, uh, they called me up to see a very famous international singer very famous, one of, one of the most famous with around 22 years old and one of the most promising singers in the world for the 
for the uh, whole show business history. And I unfortunately was, uh, they uh, looked for me, uh, uh, it was missing seven hours to the show. And I had to, together with the uh, original physician in Beverly Hills, uh, we had to, to, to decide to cancel a uh, 50,000 tickets sold show. Ah. So, uh, that was very sad for me and I'm talking about this with you because it's uh, your specific audience and I'm not, not telling the name of this singer. Um, and I, I was sad, but I, I, I didn't, I wasn't, uh, uh, I was, I, I thought, I thought, I thought at that moment that there was, uh, it was the best choice. Because if I heroically try to put a singer over a uh, stage uh, with a, a small edema, with a very strong laryngitis, severe laryngitis, he or she can develop a, an, a polyp from the beginning to the show to the end of the show. And then the rest of the tour, the world tour can be compromised because of, it, of that. So, uh, because of, of course, of, of the presence of known uh, phys uh, non physicians in the audience, I cannot talk about uh, specific medications. But you have my contact. Uh, you can uh, call me up in in uh, uh, uh, in the WhatsApp contact in in the in inbox a direct message of of the Instagram. Maybe uh, I, we could talk about about some medications. Uh, you of and of course, there are some um, surprise, no, it's not surprise, some tricks that we have <laughs> developed in the last 10 years. And one of them, I want to show up uh, in the next congresses in Europe uh, to, to maybe show you how to save the, the pre presentation of the professional voice uh, right before the stage. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, uh, apart from medications, uh, a team work is uh, also take is, take it, uh, take into account the adaptations that can be made in biomechanics of the larynx and the vocal tract to postpone surgery and to put the lesion to vibrate hidden from the audience. Uh, while the patient doesn't have the time to recover from surgery. And this is one of the, our great experiences because great part of them don't have the choice to stop everything that they are doing to perform surgery. So here is the importance of the speech language pathologist, the voice therapist that, it, that works in conjunction and knows how our medical thinking occurs. So uh, the voice therapy is also a form of uh, in, uh, uh, encountering, finding a space between the lesion and the other vocal cord uh, uh, in order to hide the lesion before uh, the ideal timing of uh, surgery. Thank you very much, Renaldo, for the detailed answer. But I thank you twice because you didn't give the exact recipe and you have just made an advertisement, and I hope that the exact recipe will be explained in a workshop in UEP 2021. Exactly. For the ones, <laughs> for the ones uh, that don't, uh, that doesn't know uh, Professor Yazaki very well, he is an executive board member of the European Union of Phoniatricians, and we will perform our congress in uh, 2021. We hope we were planning to have it in 2020 in Antalya but because of the pandemics, we will be performing it on 2021. And he will be with us with the workshop with the best recipe there for the professional voice users. <laughs> okay, and about the teamwork, I mean, uh, uh, you, you have already implied that as the, as the surgeon and as the coach of the team, uh, you take the full responsibility for the treatment of the professional voice user. Uh, exactly. you, know, you know very well, our mutual friend, uh, Professor Seftab Akbulut, is asking a question to us. And okay. What oh. if, <laughs> what if uh, a conflict occurs among us? 
I mean, uh, while giving the decision for the surgery, if, we th if you think that the patient, the professional voice user needs a surgery, and if the speech language therapist or the voice coach uh, do not, uh, I mean, are not in the same uh, decision with you, how do you handle the situation? Exactly. Uh, the best uh, uh, thing I mentioned in, during the presentation is to work in conjunction with non, already known logopedists and singing pet pedagogues. Uh, so, uh, because there is a reliability that, that is already there in the relationship between the three, the three professionals. And of course, uh, I, when I tell that I have to have my own opinion regarding indication of surgery, uh, it doesn't mean that I will convince as a dictator uh, well, that I will order them to accept surgery. It's something that we have to, now that I have my opinion that maybe the surgery is the best pathway, best exit, let's think about, uh, I want to have your opinion, uh, speech language pathologist, logopedist. Uh, as you told me that you're working with this singer for three months without too much improvement, do you think that there are more strategies uh, with my examination then can be uh, uh, Rousseau, uh, used in the next month in, in uh, attempting to overcome the difficulty uh, or uh, do you believe it's time for surgeries? Always, we have to ask the, the, the other speech language pathologists, the, the, the therapists about this. And if the therapist uh, tells me, doctor, I didn't know that he was not uh, um, stretching the vocal cords in the high tones. Now with your examination, I saw that I can try to treat this. And maybe in two months, we can, we can see, uh, he can see you again. You can see him, uh, him or her again. The same about the singing uh, teacher or pedagogue. Um, uh, I, I asked him, uh, uh, do, do, does the singer uh, is better with the voice therapy with the uh, uh, logopedist? Uh, uh, is he better in the passagios? Uh, he's, he's, he managing better than soft mix of the voice in the passage region and, and afterwards, or uh, he's always with one voice in one uh, uh, session and all, another voice in another session, and another voice after a, a weekend of uh, work. Uh, and if, in general, the, the singing teacher is the main, uh, is the, the one who wants to remove the lesion first because they know that it's not improving and they, they want uh, uh, the, their singers uh, better. But it's a, a, a, at the end, it's a final decision in which everyone will, will contribute with a little bit of their experience. It, that's why I, I uh, recommend you to work with very uh, approved and Comproved uh, experience uh, in the field. Uh, Logopedists very experienced that you know that you, that, that see that see uh, many singers uh, in a week. Thank you very much. And one of our colleagues, uh, a, a very well known phonosurgeon, uh, is asking you a question about your opinion on laser surgery for benign lesions. Okay. Uh, interesting. Uh, I, we don't have in Brazil, it's not approved, uh, uh, the KTP laser and, and the, the blue laser uh, are not approved to be used in Brazil. I believe that one of, I have 10 patients around 10 singers waiting for the blue laser and the KTP laser to be used on them here in Brazil when it's approved. But it's 10 patients over 3,000. So it's not for everybody, in my opinion. Uh, of course, I know that in Europe and in the United States, uh, they use the blue laser and the green laser uh, to reduce the size of some polyps. So they need smaller, even smaller cuts uh, during uh, phono surgery for professional voice users. I believe that this is one great point. 
But if the audience is asking questions about the CO2 laser or other lasers that uh, increase the heat or the increase the amount of tissue uh, that is removed, I believe that for singers it's not a good way because we always remove a little bit more even with the very modern technical, uh, uh, technically uh, uh, advanced lasers. Uh, but I believe that uh, apart from lasers, uh, one of, of our futures may be the flexible robotic uh, surgery. Great. And I'm trying to continue uh, with the questions. Right. Okay. After the surgery, uh, of course, this may, uh, this may change according to the type of the uh, lesion, but uh, just as an average, uh, for a professional voice user, how many days of voice rest do you recommend? The first one is, the okay. second one is, how many days later, how many weeks later they can begin to practice? And how many uh, days or weeks later they can be on stage? In general, very good question. Uh, after phonosurgery, the basic ones, uh, I call it epithelium surgery, epithelium and lamina propria surgery. I uh, recommend them six days of complete voice rest. I uh, tell them, uh, suggest them to use some apps uh, in which they, uh, digit, uh, they, they put the, the words and then uh, uh, uh, computed uh, voice uh, appears and after uh, in the sixth day they come to the office I perform the stroboscopy with zoom to see everything that happened there um, and uh, in the same day after my examination they leave the office and go to the first session of the uh, post-operative voice therapy and I recommend, if they have time, I recommend one session, but if they have time and money, I recommend them to do at least three sessions a week with the voice therapist, because I believe that this, is, uh, this improves, uh, uh, optimizes the treatment, because it's better to have someone taking, to, uh, taking your, holding your hand uh, instead of being alone and going to different uh, uh, adjustments uh, during the next six years after one session. And in general, if it's a, he or she is a singer, uh, I allow the first singing class uh, around the 28th uh, day of surgery, post-operative day, uh, that is four weeks. Uh, after four weeks, the first, but they don't leave the, the voice therapy. They go to the voice therapy and then they, they start the singing classes. And in general, they come every seven or eight or 10 days in my office. And when it's, it's around the 26th, 27th day, I saw them again. And, um, uh, and, and, and in the 40th day, I saw, I saw, I see them again. And seeing them, I can see if everything is good, the, the amount of redness uh, that is there over the, the free edge. And if he, he or she is a pop singer, CCM singer, I have allowed my patients to go back on stage after 50 to 60 days, 50 to 60 days post-operative if they are pop singers. Uh, and if they are, uh, classical singers, operatic singers, soloists, uh, mainly soloists, because there, there's a difference between solo singing and choral singing. Uh, if they're soloists, I, I always tell them preoperatively that they will need to wait for uh, the 90th day, uh, the three month period to come back to auditions and tests and professional on stage solos. And if they are not singers, uh, it can be a, a, a little bit released, uh, more, uh, more, a little bit uh, more free, it can be more free. 
they can have more freedom. Uh, if they are dubbers, I, uh, uh, I always uh, tell them they can come back to work after the 24th day in general, dubbers. And uh, the, the professors and uh, teachers of basic education, uh, I can let them go to the class on, on the 30th day if they, they, they can use uh, every day the microphones. If they can use every day the microphones, the actual speaker, uh, uh, I, uh, they, I tell them they can come back around 30 to 35 days to, to the, the jobs. Uh, and of course, there are some other tips that can, we can talk later about, about this, but in general, it's like this. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I know that, dear friends, dear participants, uh, most, of our, most of us are in our houses now. I'm in my office. It's, it's late evening in Ankara now, but uh, it's, it's afternoon in Brazil. And I know that uh, dear Renaldo has uh, scheduled appointments just uh, less than one hour now. So I need, to, uh, I need him to have, have time to relax as well after that uh, conference. I will have just one or two more questions, Renaldo. Okay. Uh, one of them is uh, coming from a professional voice users. Uh, okay. She is asking if, uh, do you recommend any specific uh, practical warm up or cool downs after surgery uh, uh, that they can use? Uh... <laughs> Very good question. One of our tricks. <laughs> you know it, uh, when dealing with singers, I have to change some uh, things that I learned in the past uh, because I saw that the way voice therapy was being uh, constructed uh, could not uh, benefit singers, could benefit non-singers, but singers would not be benefited. And when... Uh, uh, and then I started to think about the most difficult things about human voicing. For example, what is more difficult to do? A strong voice or a very soft uh, and sweet voice? In general, it's a consensus. Singers tell, tell us, doctor, it's much more difficult to sing soft than to sing strong. So first point, soft phonation. The second thing, uh, what about, uh, how was the voice before surgery? Was the voice very strong? The vowels were very pressed. So, was this before the lesion appeared? Or was, was this a, a, as a, an adaptation because of the lesion? So, if it a, appeared after the lesion, uh, we have to treat what is, what is more difficult. That is, to use soft phonation in speaking voice also. And when we use, when we try to overcome lesions in the, the free edges, in the glottis, uh, we always need more effort. But what is more effort than habitual in human voicing is using more diaphragmatic contractions, abdominal contractions, intercostal contractions in order to exhale more air in a bigger rate of velocity to increase the subglottal pressure to push up the lesion up, uh, upwards in order to hide the brakes and the hoarseness. So now that the patient does not have any more the lesion, he or she doesn't need it anymore. We can reduce the power of, of breath support. We can uh, teach them how to use it, use this uh, uh, breath support for soft phonation in speaking mainly and in singing second. And how to masterize the quantity of air needed for each phrase. Uh, that is an important part, part of the post-operative uh, uh, adaptation of voice uh, after surgery. So I, uh, the next, the first four weeks of phonosurgery, we will uh, increase intensity of the voice every week, starting from very uh, weak voice, some 
times airy, leaky, breathy, and then we'll teach the patient how to use the vocalis muscle uh, as soon as the weeks uh, pass uh, uh, in a greater uh, quantity, a greater uh, degree of contraction. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, if the patient after, uh, before surgery could not uh, put the larynx downwards, the, the logopedist will teach the patient how to put the larynx as low as possible because the lowering in mechanism in human voicing is very important for, uh, for, uh, for their health, for their long-term health. And so we will treat what was diagnosed in the previous examinations of the functional evaluation of voicing. So a very important question and that's, uh, I have observed that sometimes in the first weeks, they, uh, uh, some speech language pathologists use very uh, pressed or stronger uh, chest voices. Uh, that's the chest voice. The stronger voices will be the last ones to be uh, uh, trained in this uh, 60 or 90 day uh, procedure of voice therapy and singing voices, uh, singing classes. Thank you very much. Ronaldo, this is the last question. Uh, we have understood that uh, how detailed you do take care of your patients in, in, in, in each aspect. I mean, as checkups before the surgery, after the surgery, in, in yes. any case for different voice users. So to be able to uh, record these, to be able to document these, what okay. kind of a system are you uh, using? Are you just writing on some schemes or schemas, or are you uh, just writing them on computer? Do you take your notes uh, to your uh, to your iPad or something? How do you record them, and how do you make uh, files for your patients? How do you follow them as a record? Interesting. I... Because because because as an author, uh, as a very well known famous uh, surgeon. I know, uh, I'm sure that you, you always record your documents, your videos, your voice samples, and the, and the things that you have taught while, while you were examining your patient. So how do you record them and how do you, uh, how, how do you take care of them? Because you have a 15 years of uh, professional voice experience just your, in your own yes. voice institute now. In 15 years, it, it has changed uh, for in the, for, from a dynamic point, point of view and technology point of view. Uh, we started at the begin very beginning using DVDs, uh, DVD recorders. I think that the whole world used to have used the DVD recorders. And until 2013, I used to use the DVDs and, and, it, and it was cumbersome because you, uh, uh, take a surgery or take a, a video sample for laryngoscopy. I needed the, to use the Pinnacle Studio and then to capture everything that you know to, and cut and to make small <laughs> videos and then cut again. And uh, making a, a video was about one hour at that time. And uh, as you know, uh, since 2009, I go every year twice or four times a year to Europe. And in Europe, I, I found a, a, a, a, a, cap, a machine that captures the, the, the video samples, uh, stroboscopy and the other ones with audio, uh, that, uh, that, that is for surgery that you have. Uh, we have from Stryker, we have from many brands. And then I brought it to my, my, my office and I coupled all of my equipment cameras to this. And this equipment for surgery is, all of them are ready to record your registering, your registers uh, in Full HD nowadays. So we don't have the decrease in quality. Uh, and it's interesting because we can type the name and, and it's recorded the, the hour and, and the, the day that the examination occurred. And when you put it into a, a, a, a, a library, a HD library, external HD library, 
uh, it's possible to, for you to look, it, look for it in the search of your computer. You type the surname of your patient and you can have at, uh, at one touch the, any, any of the, uh, since the very beginning, the, the first examination until the last examination uh, for us to compare. And it's very important to compare. Uh, I know that it takes a long, uh, a little bit of time, but it's important for us to see if the morphology of the lesions changed. So the, from a practical and technological point of view, it's like this. Uh, it's a, a uh, something that captures the images and videos. And uh, it's, everything is digitalized uh, after 2013. So uh, it's there and I, uh, it's here. Uh, uh, I decided not to put it in a server because I don't rely totally in servers and, and we work with very famous people. Uh, it's it's uh, there, it's not, not plugged with my computer uh, to block hackers, okay? Uh, and uh, I think that it, it, it was about this dynamic that the question occurred, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, okay. thank you, thank you very much. Uh, okay. I just I just tried to calculate how far we are uh, from each other, and according to Google, it says that we are like more than ten thousand kilometers away oh from Ankara gosh. to Sao Paulo. It's it's so nearly il, it's it's nearly eleven k. It's nearly eleven thousand kilometers, but from such distance, you have reached us. You have reached all of our friends with your smiling face, with your great experience. And it was really a, a pleasure for me to host you in this in this lovely uh, uh, webinar. So uh, I felt that I was I was touching you, I was feeling you uh, like the days before the pandemics. <laughs> so oh. I would <laughs> so I would like you thank you very much uh, for sharing with us this great experience, and I love uh, I want the very best of everything for you for your family, for your lovely daughters uh, about the pandemics and about the upcoming days. Uh, thank you very much for everything, Renaldo. And I will leave the last words to you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. As you know, I really love to share experience. I, I have gone, had gone to more than 40 congresses in order to look for more uh, uh, different experience to form mine. And I try to couple the basic science of voice together with the, the surgery and together with the clinical part of, of our surgery, of our field. And uh, in, no, in, in, in any moment, thing, uh, uh, if I pass it to you, I, want to, I intend to, to, to appear better than anyone. I'm not no better than anyone. And I hope that you can, with my words, with the experience I shared with you, you can uh, look for more pathways and please come to UEP and share with you your experiences if it's working or if it's not. Tell me in the corridors of the congresses, uh, tell me about your opinions about the speech language uh, therapists, uh, uh, therapists uh, because it's very important for me. Uh, every, many things that I told you here today as in the congresses are not written in the books. It's about personal experience transformed in lectures. So I want to have your feedback and I want you to thank this guy, a very clever guy, very warm guy. Uh, you can count on me out, so you're my friend and I hope that everything is better for your, your, your country, Turkey, and, and of course for your uh, family also, uh, made of uh, uh, also just of female <laughs> components. <laughs> and I hope to see you soon, Aldun. Uh, I really have uh, much friendship for you. And you can call me for live sessions, for congresses, for uh, events in your country, uh, because uh, you're my friend. Thank you very much, Renaldo. I would like to also thank to all of our followers, all of our participants uh, for being with us. We will be, for, uh, we will be continuing with this Thursday webinars, uh, sometimes in Turkish, sometimes in English, but we will be uh, continuing this uh, Thursday webinars uh, each and every week. And I would like to thank uh, dear Renaldo once more again for being with us, for sharing, for reserving the uh, prime time of his uh, office uh, today for us. So uh, please keep in touch. 
We love you, Ronaldo. Stay safe and hope to meet you soon. Okay, so we are now closing the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.